Good morning. I hope you've awakened and are refreshed and uh, that you're prepared for a great day today. Thank you for joining us this morning on God Day. Uh, I want us to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Let's read the chapter in its entirety. It's only very brief. It says, There is an evil I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity, and it goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place? All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool, and what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and is striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Father, I pray that you would give clarity, that you would help us as we unpack this passage, that you would encourage us as we deal with its deep truths. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Now, I remind you that Ecclesiastes is written with this particular perspective of Solomon looking at life under the sun, what we see, what is tangible in the here and now. Throughout Ecclesiastes, his perspective is skewed to look only at what is in front of him. So it's the opposite of looking with faith. Uh, it's the opposite of looking with a perspective of heaven or eternity. And very often it's only about um, the material gains and goods of this life. He's trying to find identity, meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. And this particular passage strikes an essentially dissatisfied tone. There's a recognition that we were made satisfied, we were made to be satisfied, that this is, uh, um, I present to you, a privilege, a creation privilege of satisfaction. In this particular chapter of Ecclesiastes, it's evident that Solomon recognizes God, he recognized God's gifts, he recognized that God is the one who um, provides and there seems to be an indicator th throughout, um, and indeed later on um, particularly, that uh, Solomon understands God is um, the creator and that his creation is good. There are things that Solomon notes uh, that are good. He thinks of wealth, possessions, and honor. He lacks nothing of all that he desires. But there's a tragedy that goes beyond this creation privilege of satisfaction, um, I call it the corrupted perspective of satisfaction, where he says, I don't have the power, I don't have the desire to enjoy these things, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity, it is a grievous evil. And the rest of this chapter strikes, as I said, a particularly dissatisfied tone. So we had this creation privilege of satisfaction. You can go back to Genesis and you can look at the first two chapters there, how mankind lived in a created world that was good and recognized that it was good. Mankind, Adam and Eve, lived in this sanctuary that was Eden. And we were made in the image of God with power and dominion to enjoy 
the things that God had created. There was full satisfaction. There was goodness because mankind was right with God. But then something happens. We know of that event as the fall of man. It comes in Genesis 3 where that perspective of goodness, that perspective of rightness, and that sense of satisfaction that we were created with and for is completely corrupted. Our perspective changes. You see, mankind exchanged the source of satisfaction, the Creator, God, who is good, for a sense of satisfaction. And all the time when we exchange the source of something good for a sense of something good, the sense fails to match up to what the source can actually provide. The source of true goodness, the source of all that is good, when removed out of the equation, what is there is simply a counterfeit. What is left, what we sometimes very often gravitate towards, this, this sense of well-being, this sense of satisfaction, this sense of happiness and wealth, it actually is but a cheap model after what God created us to have. We misuse creation it gives us no satisfaction or enjoyment because we've completely abandoned the Creator. We give in to our senses, introducing sin into our lives and the lives of others, and that leads to the current situation that we are in in this world. That's the same going all the way back to Adam and Eve. They left aside the words of the source of their satisfaction, God who created all things and said it was all very, very good, and they followed their senses. They followed their instincts. They uh, followed the words of this creature, the serpent, who said, look, look over here, this tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's what you really want because God is trying to keep you from a good thing. Okay, you're made in the image of God. Well, God actually wants you uh, to stay away from attaining your maximum potential. You can actually be fully like God if you take this fruit. And so having sensed that this tree was good for food, having sensed that it was desirable to make one wise, having sensed that it was um, something in their best interest, they exchanged the truth that came out of the source of their satisfaction um, for what would bring that initial pleasure, that initial satisfaction. They see sin introduced into the world. The scriptures say that sin came into the world through one man and death because of sin. Now, there are a few ways, a few isms that I like to speak of uh, that help us see where we're at today, that help us think through this corrupted perspective of satisfaction. There's humanism, which attaches prime importance to the human rather than the divine or supernatural uh, matters. It's a philosophical stance that emphasizes the individual and social potential and agency of human beings. God is completely out of the equation. It considers human beings as the starting point for serious moral and philosophical inquiry. So humanity is the basis of all that is um, in this world, all of the good that can be in this world. Everything is down to humanity. Uh, there, in humanism is very often a, a complete abandonment of the idea of objective truth, though there's a recognition that morality and doing good is uh, healthy for the growth of society and functionality of humanity, it, it also abandons this idea that certain things are definitely right and definitely wrong. It, it boils down to what makes you happy and what pleases you, what gives you a sense of well-being. Humanism. Consumerism. 
Now, consumerism is a theory aimed at increasing the consumption of goods. And we often think, especially as we head toward holiday seasons, of the consumeristic culture that we live in. Things are made to be bought and used and got rid of so that you can then replace them and, and buy more. We're, we're a consuming culture. And very often people try to fill up their lives with things, with stuff. They consume various goods. Sometimes it's, it is edible goods. Sometimes, sometimes it's those goods that we have, those belongings that we have. But the ideology of consumerism is this will satisfy you. Get this. This is going to make you happy. You can't fully be happy unless you have this. Why not take on this? This is what will really satisfy you. But ultimately, it falls short of that full satisfaction. You get that coat and you wear it and it's nice and it's fine. You like it, but it doesn't give that satisfaction that you thought it would give. You um, purchase that latest bit of technology and, you know, it's, it's kind of cool, but, you know, it's, it's not something that really meets up fully to your expectation and it's not long before you're looking for the next thing. Then there's closely associated with consumerism, materialism, which buys into the myth that consumption that we've already talked about will satisfy as an individual. Seeing something as good, you want it, you have it, but then you fail to find satisfaction in it. These two, consumerism and materialism, are closely intertwined. We uh, can, can think of some songs, we can think of a lot of uh, poems that are out there that tell us even that, that kind of signify that what we know in our hearts that nothing will fully satisfy. A few years ago there was a, a film, I quite enjoyed it, called The Greatest Showman and one of the songs says, all the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough, never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. These hands could hold the world but it'll never be enough. And that very much is reflective of a large part of where our society is at, consumerism and materialism. We're not satisfied with life's good things. And it's very clear that Solomon is not satisfied. Does he, does he sound satisfied here? I mean, he, he speaks in a way that is grotesque. And I, I remind you, these are the words of, of Scripture, okay? So um, we have this, this is God's breathed word, but you take Scripture in its context. You have to understand the, the general point of what's being got at. What Solomon is saying throughout Ecclesiastes in many cases is um, it, he's thinking out loud and what he presents in one verse in some cases is just simply not true. It's, it's not what God created us to think like or how God created us to be. But Solomon, as he works through these things, eventually at the end of Ecclesiastes, spoiler alert, arrives at a place and at a conclusion wherein he, he actually recognizes the answer to all of these questions he asks. And he says something here that anyone who's experienced tragedy and tragedy of miscarriage or stillbirth um, would, would, would find triggering and would find um, stirring up of grief. He says, if a man fathers a hundred children lives many years, so the days of his life are uh, many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he has also no burial, I say a stillborn child is better off than he. And that, that, that's something that's really brutal to say. He goes on and he, he tries to rationalize it and walk his way out of um, that, that grotesque expression. But it's very clear that he's not satisfied with wealth, possessions, honor. He speaks of a uh, hundred children. He speaks of long life. These are all things that people look at and say, yeah, that, that would be great. Stuff, wealth, possessions. Many children, the capacity to care for many children, um, legacy, uh, long life, notoriety, uh, that, that would be very satisfying. Many people will look and, and th think at these things even still today is something that would be very satisfying. But because of our corrupted perspective of satisfaction and where it comes from, it doesn't satisfy. That leads us to uh, this third item, the consequential poverty of satisfaction. Because our 
perspective is corrupted, our perspective of satisfaction, that creation privilege of satisfaction that, that we were created with, where we, we were satisfied, we were able to abide in God and He in us, and we were able to have that close relationship with Him, and we were able to enjoy the creation and everything it had. Now that that's been corrupted and we've fallen from that, we try to exchange the source of satisfaction, the Creator, for a sense of satisfaction. They're in misusing the creation, adopting humanism, consumerism, materialism, and also there's other isms out there as well that uh, you could think of, I'm sure. That then leads, that then follows on, and the consequence is poverty of satisfaction. You, you can't have any satisfaction. As the Rolling, the Rolling Stones sing, can't get no satisfaction. Bob Marley, uh, satisfy my soul. That's all I want you to do. That's all I'll take from you. Satisfy my soul. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we're looking for. We want satisfaction, but even these, these requests indicate that we, uh, we, we can't have satisfaction. We're struggling to find satisfaction because we still exchange the source of satisfaction, the Creator, for a sense of satisfaction. And so the result is that very often we only experience, or at least we largely experience, shame. That leads us to another ism. You have these things that try to satisfy the humanism, consumerism, and materialism. It's all about trying to satisfy and trying to build ourselves up, trying to boost humanity, trying to um, fill ourselves up with the satisfaction um, in, in self. But uh, eventually, exchanging the source of satisfaction, the Creator, for a sense of satisfaction, the shame that that then produces and the dissatisfaction it produces leads us to nihilism. Because we feel betrayed by materialism, we see the empty promise then of consumerism for our individual's well-being. The question then is asked, what is the point? You're not satisfied with material stuff. Consumerism, you recognize I, that, that doesn't give us anything. This consumeristic culture it only teaches materialism and it's not actually... Well, what's the point then? What's the point to any of it better than... The miscarriage, better than the, the stillbirth is he, is what uh, S Solomon says. It's quite a nihilistic, corrupt perspective, don't you think? He says, even if the other man lives a thousand years twice over and he has seen no good and experienced no enjoyment, do not both go to one place, that is, the grave. So he's saying, we're, we're all going to die anyway. I mean, what's the point? None of this satisfies. None of this gives what we want. None of this gives us a, a sense of wholeness or fulfillment. It doesn't establish your identity or my identity. What's the point then to any of it? Nihilism. There's a, um, a poem, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Hamlet says this in Shakespeare. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. It's not Hamlet. Macbeth, correction. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Macbeth has sought to gain his power. He sought to um, ascend to uh, rule and reign that is not his to take. He's done it by devious means. He's done it by dishonesty, thinking and, and being egged on even by his wife that this is what's going to satisfy, that this is what's going to bring him uh, what he so craves. But he recognizes this way to life produces nothing and has ultimately this very nihilistic take on life that it's just a walking candle that goes about for a little time and then is off the stage. Agnosticism. So there's nihilism. What's the point? Agnosticism is an, another response, another consequence, an, a, another impoverished consequence of our corrupted perspective of satisfaction. Solomon sounds very agnostic here. He says, Who limited by human wisdom knows what is good for man during his lifetime, during the few days of his futile life? He spends them like a shadow, 
The Amplified clarifies staying busy but achieving nothing of lasting value. For, he, uh, for who can tell a man what will happen after him? Who knows? Who knows? That's what agnosticism is. Who knows? We don't know. Can we know? Um, to, to his work, his treasure, his plans. What will happen after the man? To everything that he's built his life around under the sun after his life is over. You see it there. There's nihilism and there's agnosticism. What's the point? Can we know the point? And then very often this spirals into a state of fatalism. It's, a fatalism is a family of related philosophical doctrines that stress the subjugation of all events or actions to fate or destiny. And so everything, it was fated to happen. Everything was destined to happen. And uh, there's nothing that can be done to change things. It often sees an abdication of human responsibility as well. It's commonly associated with uh, this consequent attitude of resignation in the face of future events which are thought to be inevitable. Whatever exists, Solomon says, has already been named. He sounds like a fatalist here. Long ago, the Amplified uh, clarifies that all of these things were named, and it is known f what a frail being man is. For he cannot dispute with him who is mightier than he. For there are many other words that increase futility. What then is the advantage for a man? So you see, even in, um, in the, these philosophical ideas, we have... Um, uh, essentially this presentation of Solomon that life is meaningless, nihilistic, what's the point, agnostic, can we even know the point, fatalistic, well maybe there's a point but we can't stop anything bad from happening, we can't stop um, what fate has in store for us, what is any advantage because we are not in control. But that's not where we need to conclude here. We need to consider the covenantal promise of satisfaction. Yes, there's a corrupt perspective. Yes, there's consequential poverty, uh, poverty of uh, satisfaction, but there's a covenantal promise of satisfaction. The truth is this, you and I can still know satisfaction with God. We can still be satisfied in our Creator. At the end of Ecclesiastes 5, it seems Solomon had figured this out to some large degree. He said, here is what is, I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat and drink and to find enjoyment in all the labor in which he labors under the sun during the few days of his life which God gives him, for this is his allotted reward. Also, every man to whom God has given riches and possessions, he has also given the power and ability to enjoy them and to receive this as his allotted portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God to him. For he will not often consider the troubled days of his life because God keeps him occupied and focused on the joy of his heart and the tranquility of God indwells him. The Amplified clarifies what, what that's talking about there. Solomon says there's a burden that lies heavy on mankind. And that's where he's at right now, halfway through Ecclesiastes. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Solomon, well, his soul is not satisfied with good things. He indicates very clearly he's not satisfied with these good things that he has and even goes so far as to tragically say he would be better off, it would be better off if he himself had been stillborn. Jesus, though, says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. It profits nothing if you gain the world but lose your soul. Solomon says all the labor is for man's mouth, but at the same time he indicates there's an unsatisfied appetite. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Solomon asks, what is the point? What is the good? Where, where is the way? What is the way? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, indicating that we can go to the Father and be reconciled to our Creator God and have a renewed perspective of satisfaction if we go through Jesus. Solomon, who can tell a man what will happen after him to his work, his treasure, and his plans? Who can tell what's going to happen after our life under the sun is over? Jesus says, don't worry about the stuff that we have here on earth, but on what's to come. 
Moths eat up your clothes, rust, mold, damp, cold, heat, elements, age and destroy your stuff. And one day you too will die, but the resurrection and the life is the identity of our Savior Jesus Christ. And if you trust Him, you have the resurrection and the life of Christ. Things like prosperity, children, and long life. These are expressions of God's blessing and indications of His favor, but they do not necessarily give meaning to life. They do not define who you are or guarantee that life will be satisfying and fulfilling. The ultimate meaning, satisfaction and profit that Solomon and every human being has uh, is that we should seek, um, we should seek Jesus Christ. That's our ultimate end goal. Everything else comes to nothing. Everything else, everything else goes away. Even the, those blessings that we have in the here and now. But the word of God endures forever, and His salvation is forever. The essence of evil and sin, it has been said, is to pursue satisfaction outside God. But now we can actually, through Jesus Christ, be restored. We can have that poverty of satisfaction replaced with an abundance of riches where we enjoy the good things that God gives us and employ those resources. He grants us for His glory and the good of ourselves and others. We can have a completely renewed perspective on, um, on what it means to be content with whatever God gives us. It's my prayer that you will know true satisfaction even today. Take some time just now, pray to our Lord Jesus Christ and ask that He will send His Holy Spirit to satisfy your heart even now.